It is my pleasure today to introduce Una Kim, who is a professor of physics at Cornell University. Una's interest in physics can be traced back to a frozen water bottle. During the hot Korean summers of her childhood, children used to bring frozen water bottles to school to keep cool. In second grade, she got to prepare the water bottle herself by putting it into the freezer the night before school. In the morning, she noticed that the water bottle had swollen. Her dad's explanation as to why it had happened involved molecules, hydrogen bonds, which left her rather puzzled. Despite the unsatisfactory explanation that her father gave her, she grasped that there was something very special about water. Specifically, that she was experiencing something that happened at a very small, invisible scale. So, growing up, she chose to learn more about the invisibly small by studying quantum mechanics. With the recent advent of quantum computers, which are now available to the public, quantum mechanics has gone from being a very abstract discipline to one that can be experienced through quantum computers. Questions that used to be philosophical in nature are now very practical. Una describes this transformation as a seed, quantum mechanics, that was planted in, 1920, in the 1920s and is now finally sprouting. Una's research is helping grow that seedling by focusing on applying machine learning methods to quantum systems data with the goal to analyze and predict the properties of materials. These methods are, coming, are becoming ever more popular and important since they can, they can address challenging problems in, the real, in real world applications. So now it is my great pleasure to present this year's Edward, Francis, and Shirley D. Daniels Fellow at Harvard Radcliffe Institute, Professor Una Kim. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, so my title has the word, uh, like there are some jargons, quantum and emergence and quantum matter data. I guess data is something that's not unfamiliar to most of you. Uh, machine learning, we've all heard about machine learning. Your cell phones do machine learning. But could um, perhaps the notion of emergence is something that may be um, unfamiliar. So I want to start there. So this is an example of emergent phenomena. That is, um, individuals are doing something simple, but they are doing something that is correlated and resulting in some much larger scale phenomena. Now, if we look into one person's hand, there is their phone, most likely. And inside the phone are materials that are making the phone function. And inside the materials are atoms that are arranged in a particular way and electrons that are living in there. So um, I know many of you study uh, social phenomena of human. Um, I often introduce myself as somebody who's also studying social phenomena, but social phenomena of electrons. Electrons are much simpler than human because they're fundamental particles. And so I thought maybe electron society I can understand. Just like human societies are rich, different communities have the character of a community that you cannot bring it down to an individual. You can understand human genome will not tell you how a group of 100 people would form what kind of community, more, moreover, what kind of conflicts different communities will have. Similarly, although electrons are much, much simpler compared to individual human beings, they form different communities. And that's where all the fun is. So here are examples of two different materials. Um, can you notice um, which one is shinier, top or bottom? Bottom one is most shinier. And the reason why the bottom one is shinier is because it conducts electricity better than the one at the top. Um, now, you all have the, probably the experience of metals having shiny surface. 
And the reason why metal surface is shiny is because it conducts electron better, and therefore it, the electrons that are conducting reflect the light, making it shiny. So why is the material at the top not conducting well, therefore it looks duller? It looks like a piece of rock. And it is a, actually a pretty important type of material, but it looks like a piece of rock. So we know actually quite a bit of uh, the electron society in that piece of material called YBCO. Um, and the reason why it does not conduct well is because electrons in that material are in this very chaotic state, like the scene of mobs in uh, the human society. Whereas, uh, but what's really amazing about this um, uh, Claudia mentioned that I got into my discipline ultimately because I saw water freezing and expanding. I've always been really curious about what heat does. Now you take this material and cool it down. You're going to cool it down to the temperatures that are colder than the temperature in Siberia. But you cool it down very cold and it goes through a transition where its behavior changes from this very chaotic behavior to something that I would say look like this, okay? So what do you notice in this motion of, of uh, marching people? They're very consistent. We call that coherence. They are behaving as one when there are many. So this oneness is called having a macroscopic quantum wave function. So how would, we would love to know how to take you know, how to take a group of people in a chaotic state, imagine kids, and you know, bring them to that other state. It's a very difficult question. I don't know how to answer that to this day after having kids for 12 years. But we think we can understand how to make this happen for the society of electrons. Their fundamental particles got to be doable. Now, what makes this guy special is very important for technological reasons. Silicon is a semiconductor. So what is a semiconductor? I'm describing what is a poor conductor, chaotic state, and a superconductor, very coherent state. And the word coherent is actually a technical word. I'm trying to be, you know, correct. <laughs> so um, this um, silicon, the semiconductors are, are something very interesting. They are like a bridge. So um, they are either conducting or not conducting, but they would not start conducting until there is enough of a buildup of a signal. And that you are ha having this either or state, like light switch that you can turn on and off, was the foundation for being able to use these semiconductors to um, build the computers that we currently use. So computers started from something this big. Um, this is ENIAC in 1949. It kept getting smaller and smaller, and it came to what we can hold in our hands uh, that's sort of outdated. Uh, I just got a new phone. But that phone is much more powerful than ENIAC. It's much more powerful than a building full, the computer that occupied a whole building that sent men to moon. What you have in your hand is much more capable. How did we accomplish that? How did we get small? The, the secret for getting small was the property of the semiconductor, this material. So how did we get small? We initially accomplished this on and off, um, two-state behavior with vacuum tubes, where you have to put enough electric uh, voltage for the current to spark through that was on state. Vacuum tubes are big. You can hold in one hand. Um, and obviously, they will not let you make something small. And we went from vacuum tube to the very first transistor, which led to Nobel Prize um, in physics, 1956, um, to integrated chips. But the principle, physical principle, uh, between this transistor and this chip are actually the same. It's the same principle built on semiconductors, uh, that you put enough cars behind the bridge, the bridge will close and let the cars pass. That's what a semiconductor is. So um, we have a desire in, uh, in the materials research community to come up with better materials, uh, materials that's not going to give us heat loss. You all have experience of touching your adapter. We all have laptops. 
and you touch your adapter and they're always warm. And the reason why they're warm is because they're wasting some of the energy that's coming from the power source um, through resistance. So if we have materials that are not resistant, then we, our data centers will not heat up and your adapter will also not heat up. And we've been looking for zero heat loss materials as a part of um, trying to build better computing systems. So this is, these are two different proposals using what's called topological edge states or high TC superconductivity that is something that's going to superconduct and give us that coherent behavior, not at the temperatures below the Siberian room temperature, but temperatures kind of around our room temperature. That's the vision and goal. Now, this is something that the community has been working for a very long time. Um, ultimately, to be able to predict and control materials, we need to be able to understand and control trillions and trillions of individual electrons. So because electrons are simple, perhaps controlling them might be easier um, and the same number compared to controlling 100 humans, but we have to control many more of them because they're so, so small. The quest for quantum information technology is a desire to go from on and off, black and white, to have something that's more like color. That's what qubit allows us to do. Qubit, um, which is a behavior of spin aspect of a single electron, um, has not just one or zero, but it can incorporate many more states in one qubit which makes it immediately obvious that it will be a more efficient source of storing information, but also it will be a more efficient source of expressing, um, expressing uh, models with this uh, information. Now, in trying to uh, predict new material by figuring out under what circumstances would my collection of electrons behave the way I want them to behave? Or figuring out um, how to make better uh, quantum technology, what can we do with available um, quantum computers? All of these questions, for me, um, boil down to data-driven challenges. And that's where the word data comes from. So, the community of condensed matter physicists, I am a condensed matter theorist, people who study materials, physicists who study materials, the community of condensed matter physicists have uh, made great strides in improving how much information we can ac extract from materials. 1962, when we look at a piece of material that we want to study um, in between, sandwiched between the two different uh, to, to materials that we understand better. So it's kind of a sandwich with uh, unknown meat in the middle or filling in the middle and we have you know, well understood pieces of bread. Um, we apply voltage and if the thing in the middle is not conducting until my voltage is high enough, there will not be any current going through. So if, if I plot the uh, resulting uh, conductance, that is how readily current is flowing for a given amount of voltage, until the voltage is high enough, I'm not going to see any um, signal, and then the signal can go up. Now, I, I'm having difficulty. <laughs> so this, this very sharp peak and the shape of this curve, this doesn't look like much, but this was the foundation uh, of our uh, knowledge that uh, gave us the confidence about our understanding of that very coherent state, the superconducting state. We have a theoretical model for that coherence, how that coherence emerges. And this curve, to those who know how to read the curve, tells us the, um, the, uh, the model we had correctly captures the system. So it is a very influential, simple black and white curve. But we always want to know more. So, you know, going from 1962 to 2000s, my experimentalist colleagues have worked much, much, worked very hard to replace the, uh, the barrier that is the bread uh, from, the, uh, from material to just the vacuum itself. So you bring a tip that is very sharp, these are single individual atoms, and bring the tip close to the surface at one point, and that tunneling 
jumping of the electrons off the cliff to the other C only happens at a local position. So the resulting data set is now a three-dimensional data set because I don't have one curve. Uh, my tip walks around, and at each position, it takes this curve. So I have a collection of curves, 10,000 cur curves. Now, how do I look at 10,000 curves? Once you start to look more, once you start to ask more questions, you always find there are more things happening. There is a lot more richness in the world. And now, we cannot think about just one model that's going to fit all 10,000 curves if they don't all behave the same way. X-ray, we all know about X-ray. At least, we know X-rays can go through materials and tell us about what it, what's inside. Uh, we do it at the dentist's office. Um, the very first uh, paper that made sense out of the X-ray was this one from, uh, by Bragg and Bragg, father and son who won Nobel Prize. And what they did was to look at these, uh, these peaks. This is the signal. As they rotate their sample, they have a beam of X-ray coming. So you know, in your dentist's office, they bring the X-ray source and move it around. Here, they move the sample, rotate it around. And as they rotate, they found, oh, they are, so this is in degrees, right? As they rotate the sample, they see the signal go up and down, and up and down, and up and down. So you change the angle, and the signal went up and down. This was mysterious for a while. Why is it going up and down? What does that tell us? Bragg and Bragg came up with what we call very first uh, forward model, uh, where they conjectured without being able to see it. This is the whole thing about studying this really, really small world. Humans, we can see them, but this really, really small world, we cannot see with our own eyes. So it always Im involves a lot of imagination, because light wavelength is just too coarse to see this small scale. Things are happening at scales that are much shorter than what uh, visible light can see. So without being able to see, they imagined there will be layers and layers of atoms. And there will, then once they imagined that, they thought, OK, there is a distance between the layers that uh, would be a parameter for their model. And they came up with an idea that if the X-ray light is coming and going out, these patterns would be modeled by this distance. This was such a successful what's called forward model, that is, you assume something and calculate forward what that assumption with a particular parameter will tell you. Compare that with the result. That's called forward model. This was so successful, we teach this in um, introductory physics. It's called Bragg condition. They were fortunate to have, to work, to have had to um, been working with you know, a handful of peaks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now today, we have instruments that are much more powerful. We have sensors that are much more powerful. And we don't get just three peaks. We get 100,000 peaks. Uh, there's got to be much more information in them. They can tell us about uh, things happening at um, subatomic scale. We would like to know, because subatomic scale changes change the property of material. It can go from being an insulator to a superconductor. It can go from being non-magnetic to magnetic. So we would like to know that. And that the information is there. But how do we grab them? This is, uh, what, what, uh, is a plaque celebrating the first experiment that showed quantum mechanics at, in operation. So they were showing that if you take what seems to be one type of electron, so this is one, uh, one set of data points, what well, seems to be one set of electrons that is um, in just one state, you can uh, reveal that is a superposition of being in what often in popular culture say alive and dead cat, but here it will be spin up and spin down. So one can, that, that's the spin of electron can be in this superposed state of being both until being observed. So if you have a Schrodinger cat, that we often use uh, sort of uh, in, uh, in analogy. Uh, if you have a Schrodinger cat in a quantum state, it doesn't mean it is both alive and dead at the same time. 
it, you just don't know which one it is until you observe. And when you observe the cat, it will be one of the two. And that observation, the moment of observation is called projection. This kind of measurement at, at this time when the experiment was invented was done for one spin or one qubit in today's language. Now today, we can do experiment. This was experiment done at Harvard uh, in Michelle Lukin's lab. You can do experiments involving uh, 256 qubits. And there are many, many more possibilities. And how do we think about them? So these are, uh, these are the kind of challenges that we are trying to address. And what I, uh, my group have been doing is trying to use the machine learning tools as data science tools that can help us bridge the rich, uh, rich data, rich and large data, to theoretical models and simple ideas and uh, allowing us to leverage the data uh, that are now starting to come out from quantum simulators and quantum computers. But these are tools, and um, tools may not sound like much. Well, this is a tool. It doesn't look particularly glorious. You can make a hole with it. My machine learning tools are kind of like a power drill. And yes, they both make holes. But power drill, first of all, allows me to make holes much more efficiently. But also, by changing out the bits, I can do many more things. But like any other power tool, it comes with a warning that uh, we should use it know knowing uh, what we are doing. So we've been trying to use minimalistic approaches that integrate key, key physics principles so that we're not using the machine learning tools as a black box. but uh, as something that can build our intuition on. So um, let me just give you, I want to give a, a quick example of sort of a, a example studies instead of leaving things at a philosophical level. So one, um, one case study of using machine learning tools to study emergence was uh, trying to use, uh, come up with objective hypothesis testing. So when, we, when my colleagues do experiment, they design experiment trying to tell apart different hypotheses. Is this a good model, or is that a good model? Model one, model two, model three, model four. They want to be able to tell apart which of the models for the secret lives of electrons are correctly capturing uh, what is seen um, outwards, because our ability to view the life of electrons is limited. What we thought we could do is to uh, think of this problem as same sort of problem as trying to decide on which number this is representing between different choices of handwritten digits. And that's the kind of approach of um, supervised machine learning. Supervised machine learning um, tools, uh, algorithms, have to come up with a decision when presented with data. And it's very much like the, my, my algorithms go through the same process as this poor kid would go through. The kid has to take the input from, uh, from the situation he or she is in. How long has it been? Is mom watching? If mom happens to be the bad cop in the family, how sweet is it? This was always a very important question to my kids. Also, how green is it? You can see some of these will influence their decision one way. Some of these will influence their decision in a different way. So, but these are all the inputs that you take from the data. And you have to come up with a decision. For this kid, the decision will be binary. For my machine learning algorithm, trying to dis differentiate, uh, discern which model best describes the phenomena, it will be trying to pick, so answer a multiple choice question. Ultimately, we're trying to find the mapping from the set of input to an output. It's a function. So what happens in, in the brain, I can only imagine. But there are obviously different parts of the brain having different levels of thought. And each part of the brain would take different pieces of input with different degree of weight and different degree of bias. You can already guess for my kids, especially when they're younger, and even to the age of 12, how sweet is it tend to bias in one way? How green is it tend to bias in an opposite way? So there are weights and biases involved. And different parts of the brain would have different weights and different biases. Now, um, we all wish, if you're a parent, you could go into their brain 
and write the right function. Not possible uh, physically. But moreover, once the function is complicated, we don't even know what we want to write because we don't necessarily know the whole outcome. So what do we do when we cannot go into our kid's brain and write that function? Even if we could, we don't know how to do it. What do we all do? We give feedback. We give feedback after something happens. No, 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 you don't want to do that. Or we give feedback, OK, that was OK. So this feedback process is how we train neural networks as well. So we start with what's called labeled data. Now this whole thing can become less, um, less uh, cartoonish once I turn off other cartoonish things and say this is a function. Um, but what we do in, in, in my research is we give neural network a set of labeled data, and the neural network, using that feedback it gets each time it executes the uh, giving out the outcome, adjusts these weights and biases. It adjusts its brain. It rewrites its brain so that with the goal of trying to align its decision with my label. And it's, it's uh, quite fun, and that works. So what have been able to do that is consequential with this approach? We started looking at uh, data set looking like this. This is nanometer. So you can see this is a very small world that is being looked at. Um, it looks like a piece of modern art, beautiful to my eyes. Uh, this is just one example of the data set collected by my colleague uh, over a decade. So he had a whole pile of data he collected like this, but they didn't know exactly how to look at it. There was an obvious question to ask. What is the organizational principle for electrons to form this orderly pattern or a motif? Um, should we start from a lattice or a, a sort of a rigid limit where everybody's put in place and then starting to wiggle around? Or should we start from a limit where everybody's freely moving, which gives us what's called a Fermi surface? But this is a limit where everybody's freely moving and just starting to interact. This is a limit where everybody's kind of put in their position because they don't want to be on top of each other. What is the right starting point? Starting from these sort of simple ideas, we were able to form a training set that are consistent with each of the hypotheses, train the neural network, and then uh, we gave the neural network the data that it has not seen before, that's the experimental data, and it gave us the surprising um, answer. It told us that uh, 12, the decades worth of data that was collected on different materials at different time with some parameters of the material changing had something common among them in terms of what is the dominant motif. Nobody knew to think about this data set from the perspective of what is a dominant motif, but looking at it from machine learning, it was very, very natural. And we discovered the dominant motif is actually of this form where everybody is facing one way. There is sort of a, a unidirectionality, everybody trying to uh, face one way. And there is period. Um, before it repeats itself, I have to go one, two, three, and four. It comes back to, the, back to itself. And this was happening over a wide range of samples. And um, it, it's consistent with an idea that uh, the electron spins on the site, what's called on the copper site. This is a material consisting of copper and oxygen. There's one copper and two oxygens uh, forming the whole uh, material. Uh, the, the copper side spins, and the uh, uh, holes that are going in, or the electrons that are removed from the oxygen sites, uh, can co co cooperatively arrive at this kind of arrangement as an optimal state. There was a theoretical idea uh, towards that, but it wasn't verified because there are many different ways to look at the system. And this paper gave, uh, uh, gave this verdict that this is uh, the uh, consistent way to look at the data in an op uh, objective way. Now, uh, I will quickly go over another approach that is unsupervised machine learning. So in the previous approach, we had this label training set. I had, as a parent, preconceived notion that it is not okay to eat ice cream that's been sitting on the floor for 10 minutes. It's okay to eat cherry tomatoes that just touch the floor. 
I have such preconceived notions and bias. And similarly, when I look at the data, I, my conceived notions and bias enter how I form the hypothesis. Now, we wanted to have an approach that is not influenced by the bias. So this is a sort of a artistic illustration, which I would love to get help from um, some of you to improve my artistic illustration. Artistic illustration of how a large data set is changing as we change temperature. So at each temperature, we take data set. And, something, and this is actually real data. And some aspects are changing, some aspects are not changing at each point in this parameter space, the coordinate. What can we learn from that? When the volume of the data is terabyte. Now, terabyte is so big, we often don't have a good sense of what terabyte means. But if you bought a latest phone, which boasts terabyte, and you look at your data usage, your usage of your uh, or memory, you will quickly find that all the pictures that you have you know, don't come close to terabyte. So terabytes are actually, you know, it's a big amount of data. So how do we approach trying to uh, study such uh, large volumes of data? If you haven't noticed yet, I seek the uh, work-life balance by trying to get inspirations from my interaction with my kids. And this is something that I had to do during um, pandemic. I was often asked to find the piece they need for their project from this embarrassingly large pile of Lego. Okay, so if you were ever tasked with that, you would know picking out one piece at a time and inspecting, is this the piece I'm looking for? Is this the piece I'm looking for? Very bad strategy. We cannot pay attention for more than five seconds doing that repetitive task, and you will more likely than not miss the piece that you are looking for. So then how should I approach this you know, exist existential threat as a parent because I want to be done with this task and go to my Zoom meeting. So it was very obvious and intuitive to not stop approaching this as let's look at one piece at a time, but instead do this. Let's first sort. And if the piece that you're looking for is red, I just have to look at the red bin. Sorting is a much more uh, uh, automatable process. We do, you don't have to ask complicated questions. So perhaps that is a productive direction to deal with my terabytes of data. But uh, for pieces of Lego, it was obvious what my sorting criteria should be. Color, shape, you can pick one of those. What do I do with my uh, terabytes of data? What would be a good sorting criteria? What we realized is that we can use sort of a fundamental principle of how we think about collective behavior, which is to recognize there is entropy, uh, energy, energy dictated by what we call Hamiltonian, or the interaction between the uh, entities, particles, electrons, and entropy whose effect gets um, magnified as the temperature goes up. So our objective in optimizing uh, our system's objective is always to lower this function called free energy, F. And you can see in lowering F, you would want to lower E or increase S depending on the temperature. So as I lower the temperature, influence of E, that's the energy and the interaction, would become more and more magnified. So we thought, OK, let's look at not try to look at data at a, one particular temperature, one at a time, which is what we typically try to do. But let's try to look at the whole thing as a series and just try to focus on the trend at each, each coordinate. We treated different coordinate position, each of these Q um, positions coordinate, as if it is a coordinate of a human being, and the temperature a as their lifetime. You know, as you go through your life, your um, health may change for most of us, just like your uh, health data of an individual can change as a function of time. Intensity of x-ray at a, uh, at for individual Q will change as a function of temperature. And there will be trends, different trends, in how they change. So using this, we wanted to ask whether we can learn um, a, 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 a material like this with a unit cell consisting of two atoms, that is a repeating unit consisting of two atoms, whether it's going through period doubling or period multiplying um, change, or whether it's going to things just adjusting inside each unit. Um, 
and whether there is fluctuation or wiggling going on. Now, this is quickly, it will quickly get too technical, so I won't go into details, but just to share a little bit of uh, what comes out of all this, this is an example of what's called pyrochloric cadmium renate. This is kind of illustration of just looking at cadmium and rhenium. You can read this formula to recognize that there are two cadmiums, two rhenium's, and seven oxygens inside a given unit. And I'm not drawing oxygens because it's going to make, become too complicated. Now, this material where atoms are arranged in this particular way becomes the uh, superconductor, that very coherent state that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, eventually, as we, this is temperature measured in um, absolute temperature Kelvin. Uh, starting from room temperature, uh, as you cool down, eventually it becomes a superconductor. But before it becomes a superconductor, it goes through transitions where they collectively change their relative arrangements. This signal, this is specific heat, uh, which has a big signal when, you go, when, when we go through melting transition, my favorite thing, water, or um, liquid gas transition, boiling, specific heat, how much heat do you have to supply to raise temperature, goes through a big change. And it's a signal to us that there is something collective happening. This signal is on relative scale rather big, but it's known, it was known separately, independently, that the movements of the atoms are at a picometer scale. Now, picometer is so small, most of us do not have a good feeling for what picometer is. Once you start putting some meter, you know, something else meter, it just all sounds small. So picometer is a tenth of a size of a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom is the smallest atom there is. Picometer is a tenth of a size of hydrogen atom. So these atoms in this material, at that particular temperature where there is this big peak showing up in specific heat, readjust their position by five picometer. But they readjust so that in a way where the regularity, symmetry of the material changes. When the symmetry of the material changes from being inversion symmetric, this being same as that, or being mirror symmetric, these symmetry changes have dramatic uh, macroscopic impact on the property of the material. So we would like to understand that better. So by uh, treating the data set, you know, my experimentalist colleague gave me eight terabytes of data. It was actually uh, shipped in hard drive because we couldn't transfer it over internet. Um, and in 10 minutes later, our x -tech algorithm, X-ray temperature series clustering, took data that looks like this, all soup of curves, intensity at each of the Q points, the, the individuals, uh, positions, uh, as a function of temperature, to this rather simple and pleasant looking um, reduction of the data. So the algorithm told us that there are one type of behavior whose intensity is small at high temperature, goes up, um, reminding you of that free energy, something that goes up at low temperature says it is a collective interaction-driven phenomenon. So this is something that is interesting. And this other trend that's not changing much as a function of temperature is not interesting from the perspective of collective phenomena. By having this separation, just like I could focus on the bin of red, bin, red Legos, I could just focus on these uh, set of uh, points and dig deeper and figure out that um, at that transition where the specific heat was jumping, not only, uh, how, not only which atoms are moving, but that these two atoms are moving just out of phase, which will result in breaking of the symmetries, and that there is fluctuation um, as, if, as, as my uh, material try to decide between being in this structure and this structure, it's kind of fluctuating, indecisive, and that fluctuation was also revealed for the first time. So to summarize, um, what my, my uh, big quest is always uh, being curious about the mysterious lives of electrons. Uh, they are secretive, they don't let us know everything. That's the fundamental principle of quantum mechanics, uh, not my incompetence. Um, so it's kind of nice to function where there is a fundamental limit, 
And so, you know, we all are on the same plane, we can only know so much. So given that situation of we all are being only allowed to know so much, the rest is we have to fill the gap with imagination, make guesses, and see, come up with a nice, a systematic and rigorous way of testing those guesses. And we're finding using machine learning tools from data science perspective can be extremely helpful for this pursuit. And um, I, we, I feel like we are in this kind of moment where uh, this is a scene from this wonderful movie, Hidden Figures, these group of human computers transition from being human computers to programmers of a new machine computer which replaced many other human computers. And uh, to, my, to our students, um, our, what, what, we, what I think is that you know, they are going to live the life of future and it's not a matter of whether machines going to replace human, uh, machines not going to replace human physicists, but uh, they can do certain things more effectively. And by being able to leverage and knowing how to program those machines, we can have more creative thoughts, you know, while drinking coffee. So that's my um, that's my uh, story. So well, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Una. Let's. Thank you so much for sure. the terrific talk. Um, let's see if we can unpack some of the, of the talk today. The first question is actually, I would say, more, more philosophical in nature. Um, should electrons be treated as social entities when they are non -sentient, not sentient? Are they animated? Hmm. If animated means moving by itself, <laughs> they are animated. Um, but there is this, I think the most difficult concept to, um, well, it, it, one of the really uh, challenging thing to, uh, appreciate, which actually took physicist community a long time to recognize, is that electrons are all indistinguishable. So um, there, it, it, that's an interesting piece of thought. Individuals are all different. Um, you know, no two individuals are the same. But electrons are so simple uh, to the extent that they are indistinguishable. So that makes it a very different society, if it is a society. I use the analogy of uh, you know, social to convey the notion of interaction. So what one electron does is not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is how do a collection of electrons behave? And how do a collection of electrons behave is dictated by the uh, the movement they in individually have, that's called kinetic energy and how they interact with each other. And in, that, in the sense that the interaction is important, there is, a, there is this analogy to human beings, because human beings are very interactive beings. But um, if animated means having uh, you know, decision-making power and uh, free will, uh, not quite. <laughs> I don't know whether that's an answer to the question. So how do you know um, the machine learned results are correct. Right. Um, so machine learning algorithms are often um, designed to capture uh, complicated functions. And when you have something, a complicated machine, it's hard to know what it is doing. A uh, big difference between an old car, which didn't involve any computer, and you know, today's cars. You know, old car, you could fix. Today's car, you got to bring into the mechanic who will first thing they do is to hook up the computer's uh, computer, uh, the, the car's computer, uh, into the car's computer. So there is a danger when you have a powerful machine, uh, you may not know what, what it is doing. And maybe it will spit out result that excites you, but what if it was making the seemingly correct decision for the wrong reason? Then you cannot bank on that, you cannot build on that. So uh, what, we, uh, are, we, what we try to do is to use 
whenever possible, we try to stick to simpler algorithms as much as possible so that we can be in more control of what is being learned. And we keep asking what, is been, what has been learned at each stage. And we also try to benchmark against uh, cases where we know what the answer should be. But that's a very important element to get right if we want to use machine learning for science. So kind of expanding a little bit on that, what can quantum computers do today? Right, so quantum computers today, um, there are maybe about 50 qubits um, in the most 50-ish qubits in um, some machines. And they are very noisy. And I gave an analogy of a qubit being more like a sphere. So it, 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 we actually think of a state of qubit as a ball. And you can imagine if you have a ball somewhere, you can easily roll off from one contact point to another contact point. That's why qubits are much more susceptible to noise because it is not just two state. As a ball, it can have much more expressibility, infinite expressibility one ball has. But if you wanted it to be in one state, it can easily tip away from it. So um, today's com quantum computers have noisy qubits and there aren't many of them. So what can we do with today's computer? Something that I'm really excited about right now is um, what we were able to do recently with just 10 qubits. With just 10 qubits, we were able to simulate uh, or manifest a behavior of, of a particle that had only ever been imagined. So it, this particle with what's called statistics, that is how uh, particles see each other, there are only two types in nature called fermions and bosons. And, uh, but under a strongly interacting communal setting, there can be different types of particle-like behavior. And with 10 qubits, we proposed how to simulate uh, this imaginary particle behavior. And uh, it is something that can be done with 10 qubits. This can also be used to encode information in a, in a much more um, secure way or error corrected way. That is, um, instead of using one qubit with its, uh, its ball that can uh, always be tipped a little bit with somebody blowing at it, uh, with 10 qubits under a specific arrangement, we can make a, a qubit that is much more um, secure, something that we can control with greater degree of confidence. So this, I think it, this is one example of application. Um, it's good for studying um, fundamentally quantum behavior. So small molecules, molecules that are important for medical purposes uh, or how our body function, there are many of them are they are small and their structure can change what functions they can, they can um, exhibit. And um, studying the chemistry of small molecules in a fundamentally quantum mechanical way is one of the applications of um, today's quantum computers. That's right. And what are the biggest challenges in the quest for finding superconductivity materials? Um, so the challenge here is uh, super finding superconducting materials is not hard. Uh, you know, aluminum that you all have in your kitchen turns out superconducts. Did you know that? No. No, right? Why wouldn't you know that? Because it does not superconduct in your kitchen. Why does, not does it not superconduct in your kitchen? It would only superconduct at very, very, very low temperature. So many metals that we, we can grab, our, uh, grab a hold of actually do superconduct, but they only superconduct at very low temperature. So question is not a matter of finding a superconductor, because actually there is a principle that says all metals should eventually superconduct. Just we don't know when that eventually is. And turned out, answering the question of when do they start superconducting, I show you that, showed you at the example at the beginning, sort of my depiction of what happens going from a bad metal to a superconductor, like going from chaotic state to a very harmonious state. Um, it happens as we lower the temperature eventually. 
just knowing what that eventually is is called critical temperature. And that turns out the predicting that critical temperature is extremely difficult because it depends a, a lot on um, details of individual system, which we don't often know of. And what are the, some of the risks, going back to the machine learning uh, aspects of your talk, what are the biggest risks um, of machine learning in relationship to quantum computing and uh, you know, quantum mm. matters? Yeah, quantum matters. So I, I, uh, I, I think the big risk is, is it comes back to, you know, how do you know whether you can trust? Mm -hmm. So um, for machine learning to contribute to scientific progress, we need to be able to, we can, we, we start with a scientific question, we go to a tool and try to uh, go from data to some sort of answer. And then we should come back and ask, did the process of, that process of getting to the answer, make, does that make sense to our uh, scientific thinking? Does it make sense to our framework of thinking? The big risk is uh, just looking at the answer and not asking how did it get to the answer because the answer might seem good to you. So that's the most dangerous thing. Right, just yeah. leave it, taking it for granted. So um, where do you see the field of quantum mechanics going over the next five to 10 years? What we sh should we expect? Um, so this dif these are all those difficult questions. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, there are some really exciting experiments that are coming up, coming out. Um, actually, it's going to come out very soon, in a couple of weeks. And um, that, is, that is going to change, uh, these experiments are going to change uh, um, how many qubits we need to be able to encode what's called logical qubit. So now I, I gave you an example of the switches. So in all your computers, there are lots of uh, classical bits or these switches. And your computer will say you have so many bits of memory. Um, it actually has more than what it tells you because those more are there to do error correction because they can flip for you know, wrong reason. So what happens if they flip for a wrong reason? If you store actually a bit of information on one bit, that information would be corrupted. So instead, we use redundancies. We store one bit of information on quite a few number of physical bits so that one uh, fluctuating would not corrupt your data. Similarly, we want to do that for the qubits, but qubits are much more sensitive to noise, as I described. So we had always thought we need 40, 50 qubits to uh, be able to error correct for one logical information carrying qubit. There are some experiments coming out that's going to make that make a big difference in that front, which is going to, uh, which, which can bring us closer to being able to do meaningful computations with like actual computations with these logical bits. So these kind of developments, like this experiment that's about to come out, which I cannot disclose yet, uh, <laughs> um, it was, not, it was not expected. We didn't know it was going to come. We didn't know as early as last February we we're going to have this experiment. It just like ideas came together and things happened and suddenly it became possible. So the progress is nonlinear, but each of those leaps can get us to a totally different place. What I am sure, uh, so I, can, I don't know where we'll be in five years, uh, but what I am sure is that like any growth process, there are nonlinear um, jumps that can happen. And uh, with more bright minds um, pouring into thinking about this, we will learn more about what we can do with quantum mechanics. How can we use quantum mechanics? I am guaranteeing that you're not going to have a super uh, quantum computing laptops in five years or 10 years. Maybe never. Um, that is not going to happen because most quantum computers require low temperatures, and you don't want to have one of those gigantic fridges with liquid helium, you know, carting that around. It's heavier than any of your laptops, so you don't want to do that. But we won't need it because these quantum computers are going to be uh, 
located in some location physically and we'll access it through cloud. Already we can access quantum computers by cloud. Um, and what we can do and how we can play with it is I think it's going to become much more accessible. Right. And, you know, we, we talked, you talked in your uh, presentation about properties of materials and that's why you are concentrating on quantum computing and using right, it. Right, right, right. So is it possible to imagine um, areas in our lives where um, changes in materials that quantum computing allows will change, you know, our... Absolutely. So we, which area should we pay attention to? Oh, um... I think the, the probably the first coming is going to be from chemistry and medical application, mm -hmm. possibly, of molecules, like mm -hmm. understanding structure. The same molecule, meaning molecule made of same atoms, depending on how those atoms are arranged, can function very differently in our human body. And then there are some molecules that are pretty small and quite important in the proper functioning of the body whose structure we don't always know. Like we don't know the structure um, because it, it's hard to learn from just the experiment. But if you combine the experiment with modeling that can be done with quantum computers that can tell us what what's the difference in structure between molecule that is functioning properly and when it is not functioning, and that will help us go towards how do we make it function better. So I, that could be a direction where we can have a sort of experience or experience, uh, ex something that we can experience like uh, tangibly. Yeah. One minute for a question and one minute for an answer. How do you choose which problems to, you, to work on in your area? Um, so I choose, um, I, I, I first look at the problem uh, often not from the traditional physics perspective, but from the data science angle, if I'm trying to apply machine learning. I ask what kind of data problem is this and whether the existing tools are enough. So usually um, I tell my students if you divide any number by zero, it is infinity. So if there isn't an existing tool for answering a specific data problem, that is there or is there not? That's the first question we ask. And if there is an existing tool, we try to ask, is this similar to any other data problem out there? Is it more like Netflix recommendation problem? Is it more like self-driving car? Is it more, more like facial recognition? Can we try to find a rough application of machine learning that this data problem is share some aspect, important aspects of? And that's, if we can find the answer there, then we know where to start, mm -hmm. and that's when we will start working on it. Wonderful. Thank you. This is all we have time today uh, for. Thank you, Una, for your presentation and your perspective. I want to thank the audience for their terrific questions. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us for uh, other program, Aracliff programs in the future. You can uh, find out future programs and watch videos of past events at aracliff.harvard.edu. This is all for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. <laughs>